Hello, everyone, and welcome to the last session of day two, which is the session on ICSID arbitration, opportunities, concerns, and alternatives. It gives, gives me immense pleasure to introduce, I think, what is the most dynamic panel um, I, I have been lucky enough to be uh, a part of so far. Um, to introduce our moderator, Mr. Madhavendra Singh, he is a Navy commander appointed to the Ministry of External Affairs uh, by the government of India. And apart from having experience and in acting as an arbitrator, he often advises the government on um, matters of international commercial arbitration, maritime uh, law, and various investment disputes as well. Um, with that, I move on to our speakers for today. We have Ms. Uh, Claudia Frutos, who is a partner, partner with Curtis Mallet. Uh, she is based out of Washington, D.C., and has, in addition to, of course, a very uh, flourishing international commercial arbitration practice, she has extensive experience in ICSID arbitrations and other uh, investor state dispute resolutions. Um, she has represented a number of state governments during her, uh, the course of her career. Welcome, Claudia. Uh, our next panelist is Jan Paulson, who needs no uh, introduction. He is one of the most celebrated arbitrators with over 40 years of experience and has represented both investors as well as a number of state entities. Welcome, sir. Um, next, I move on to Meg Kino, who is not only the Secretary General of ICSID, but also the Vice President for the World Bank Group. On an average, she ha handles uh, maybe 300 investor state arbitrations every year, which is a feat in itself. Welcome, ma'am. And our last but not the least panelist for today is Mr. Prabhash Rajan, who is um, an, a senior assistant professor at um, the South Asian University. He has authored a number of articles and papers at, which he does on a daily basis and has also authored the book, India and Bilateral Investment Treaties, Refusal, Acceptance and Backlash. And most recently, he has uh, been invited as an expert witness on the relationship between India and BITs, which is a very complicated relationship, safe to say. Um, without further ado, I hand over to the panelists. I would only like to point out that this session is being transcribed. Thank you so much for that uh, crisp introduction to all the speakers. Uh, hello and uh, wishing a very pleasant evening to everyone. It is my pleasure today to be moderating this session alongside distinguished panelists like Yon, Claudia, Mac, and Prabhash. And uh, I would not miss this opportunity to thank MCIA for uh, giving this opportunity and also to congratulate Neeti and Madhikeshwar for having put this whole event together at this scale. I mean, it's impressive. Thank you. So uh, the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes was commissioned in October 1966. And today has an impressive 155 state signatories to it. Although India is not a signatory yet. So today we're going to talk about the exit convention, the opportunities, concerns, and the alternatives. Uh, uh, just for the information of the participants, there are not much housekeeping announcements. There's just one that you can put in your uh, questions in the Q&A section, but we will take the questions only towards the end. ICSID uh, also provides the facilities and administers the international investment uh, disputes under the uh, ICSID convention, the ICSID uh, additional facilities and the AF rules, and also ANSI trial arbitration rules. Now, uh, speaking of uh, you know, the customary international law, I'm just trying to put things in perspective that every state has a sovereign right uh, to uh, uh, legislate, to basically prescribe laws and to enforce and execute those laws in its jurisdiction and lay down procedures and adjudicate and by the courts provided by their own government. 
Also, it is pertinent for me to mention, as since we are trying to create the narrative, that recently the figures given out by the United Nations Conference on Trade and uh, Development gives out very impressive figures uh, about the dazzling FDI inflows which India has seen recently. Just to quote year 2020, in the uh, midst of COVID pandemic, India was the only country among the only two countries that have had positive FDI inflows and in India saw a figure of 13% increase in the FDI. China saw 2% and none other. Everybody else has a, had a decline. I'm saying that because there is a belief that a good, robust a dispute resolution mechanism in a country is responsible for attracting investment in that country. But seeing the dazzling FDI figures of India, that may not be, or may be true. We'll see that a little later. India saw its uh, first uh, adverse uh, award in 2011 from uh, the White Industries Australia and unilaterally rescinded most of its bilateral investment treaties and came up with a model BIT in 2015. In fact, uh, Pravas was one of the members of the Law Commission which uh, reviewed that model BIT in the Commission 216. Now, one of the things, uh, reasons for the skepticism that India has had is, of course, an absence of a provision to challenge the exit award, but as also is an imbalance, which is a felt that there is uh, no obligations put on the investors, but too much on the home state. Also, it does not really like the idea of investors, you know, selectively borrowing favorable clauses from third country agreements and also uh, go about treaty shopping. So I'll come to that skepticism a little while later. Uh, now to talk about, in fact, if we have to speak about the India's legal position on investment treaty arbitration, we have to talk about the BITs, but in a little while, but let's first start with the exit convention. So Meg, you are the uh, secretary general. You know, I would like you to uh, give an opening pitch why should India join the uh, convention? You know that India is a growing economy. It certainly wants to protect, like any other state, the powers to regulate the trade and investment at par with its domestic uh, parties. But at the same time, now India is emerging as a capital exporting state. It's also uh, its responsibility to protect uh, its investors abroad. But I feel, and I have reading the literature, I realize that India is not the only country which has certain concerns with the exit convention because I see a lot of Latin American countries and even Africa and South Asia, they have concerns. So let's start with you. You give me your opening pitch and let's see uh, what you have to say that why should India you know, join the exit convention? Over to you. Thank Mike. you. Thank you, Madhvendra. Uh, it'd be no surprise that I certainly believe that the time to revisit the discussion on joining ICSID for India is right now. First of all, the past concerns about membership, I think, have largely been addressed mainly by the model bit of 2015, which, of course, is fully consistent with the ICSID scheme, including things such as a double key definition of investment, which is now incorporated in the model bit exhaustion of remedies, which is very much consistent with Article 26 of the convention, key exclusions, things like exclusions for taxation and measures by local government, an obligation to have investors act in compliance with domestic law. So I think a lot of the hesitations that used to be mentioned have really been addressed by that. You'll note in particular that the model bit does contemplate ICSID membership. And to make that contemplation real, ICSID would need, uh, India would need to join ICSID. You've noted in particular the huge gains India has made in terms of recent economic policy and its focus on investment liberalization. And in particular, obviously, you will want to continue that progress and accelerate it post pandemic. And it's an important thing to note that that has not just been progress in terms of FDI and investment into India. Another important aspect of that has been outward investment by Indian citizens. And of course, these bits uh, require and address both inward and outward investment. Uh, ICSID is a strong signal about the investment climate and will support 
those primary goals. Secondly, many don't realize that ICSID is both an institution and a set of rules and a, an arbitral facility. From an institutional perspective, ICSID is one of the five institutions of the World Bank. It is the only one that ICSID is not a member of. Uh, I would suggest that it's time for ICSID, uh, for India to take its place at the table at ICSID. It's eligible to, eligible to join at no cost. And this is a table with 155 other member states, including all of the G7 states and all of India's close neighbors in proximity, as well as those countries that it tends to trade with, UK, EU countries, uh, USA, its main trading partners. Joining gives India a vote on all governance measures. And I think this is especially important right now because ICSID is in the middle of a rules amendment process that is dealing with key issues, things like security for costs, third party funding, expedited investor state and investor state mediation. And I truly think India should and would want to be part of shaping those rules for the future. Membership is also a way for India to highlight domestic expertise in this field, as it gets the right as a member to put eight people onto the panels, which are a pool for appointment. Thirdly, and my last set of points here is as an arbitral facility and a set of rules. ICSID is the world's premier investment arbitration institution. It has done over 70% of all known cases, more than 800 cases now, it is well documented as the least expensive option for investor state with very low institutional fees and a cap on arbitrator fees that is typically two to three times less than what is paid in the UNCITRAL rules scenario. It is well known for its expertise and impartiality. It operates in all regions of the world and has a well known set of rules that treat investors and states equally regardless of a development status or regional location. Litigants always work within that delocalized system. In other words, you are within proceedings at the center. And that means that you will never be in the states of your adversary in their domestic courts, nor in the domestic courts of a third unrelated state, which tends to happen when you have a non-exit scheme. Finally, these are rules that very much are designed for investor state. They have things, for example, like a screening before the case starts to ensure it is within jurisdiction. It has this double keyhole definition of investment, summary motion to dismiss claims manifestly lacking in jurisdiction, a number of procedural mechanisms baked into the exit rules that are very specific to the investor state context. In terms of rules as well, ICSID has always been a leader in transparency and offers the most transparent set of uh, investment rules, which is clearly important to India when you look at the model bit and what it addresses in terms of transparency. And most important of all, something we'll discuss in detail later, it has a unique enforcement mechanism, which is truly the gold standard. And we'll talk more substantively about that, but it's certainly a benefit of ICSID membership that should be kept in mind. Okay, Mac, thank you so much. Indeed, uh, that was a great opening pitch, I must say. But I can see that uh, Prabhash really does not look very impressed. He's very pensive. So that <laughs> brings me to uh, Prabhash now. In fact, I'm very, hard, very heartening to note, uh, Mac, that you have, you're acknowledging, I'm sure you're following the developments in this jurisdiction, what India is doing, that you say that model bit is addressing most of the concerns and that uh, exit does provide a very uh, convenient forum for investor uh, state dispute resolution. So Prabhas, uh, you are the member of Law Commission 260, which was tasked to analyze the model BIT of 2015 uh, would you take our participants a uh, little into the recent too far back, but a little uh, recent background of uh, the skepticism of India about the ISTS mechanism itself? And tell us why India was and why India still is uh, skeptical about uh, the ISDS in general and exit convention in particular. One of them, of course, we mentioned about is the absence of the mechanism for addressing. 
And uh, of course, uh, I would come to you once again a little later to talk about uh, the uh, deeper aspects of the bits and the reforms that uh, we are going through and the discussions that are happening. But for the time being, in the next two minutes, if you can briefly take us into a recent background of what happened, especially from 2011, and what is the skepticism all about that India holds? Yeah, thank you so much, Madhvendra. Let me first say that I'm extremely delighted to be part of this discussion. Thank you to MCIA and to ICSID for this opportunity. Uh, I will basically divide India's concerns about ICSID convention or ICSID membership into two parts. Uh, the first set of concerns pertains to concerns uh, related to ISDS mechanism. Uh, now, India lost the white industries case and after that India was sued by a large number of foreign corporations for PIT breaches. Uh, recently, India has lost a few more cases. Now, perturbed by these developments, India decided to unilaterally terminate a large number of investment treaties and also decided to come up with a new model investment treaty. Uh, and if you carefully read the model investment treaty, India's skepticism towards the ISDS mechanism is writ large. So while India has not rejected the ISDS mechanism uh, like a few other countries, but it has conditioned uh, its jurisdiction or it, the acceptance of the ISDS mechanism to a large number of large number of conditions. Now, India's concerns about lack of transparency with the ISDS mechanism or the argument that the ISDS mechanism is biased in favor of foreign investors uh, and against developing countries like India or the argument that the ISDS mechanism does not quite respect the sovereign right to regulate of individual countries. Now, some of these concerns about ISDS are also projected as concerns with ICSID convention or ICSID membership. Uh, and this to, to some extent explains India's reluctance about joining ICSID. Now, whether this is a valid concern or you know, uh, whether these, these criticisms are valid, I leave that question you know, to be decided on some day later. But these are, these are concerns which India presently has, at least the Indian government presently has. The second set of specific concerns pertains to issues of enforceability, as I see it. Uh, of course, let me, let me say that the Indian government hasn't put out a paper or hasn't uh, spelt out in black and white what its uh, objections with respect to exit convention are. But as I see it, one of the important uh, concerns that India has or would have is about enforceability. So we all know that you know, when it comes to enforceability of investment treaty awards, the enforceability of exit arbitral awards is different from non-exit arbitral awards. Uh, in non-exit arbitral awards, uh, there are opportunities to, to contest the award at the seat of arbitration and also to resist the enforcement of the award. Uh, now, these opportunities are not present when it comes to exit convention. The only option available is to go for the annulment of the award. Uh, and the reason for this is Article 54 of Exit Convention, which says that exit arbitral awards are to be considered as the as as the, as the judgment of the court of that state. Uh, now, uh, as per my understanding, I think India would like to have greater control over arbitral awards uh, in case it loses cases, in case there's an adverse award issued against Republic of India. Uh, and, and, and perhaps the government thinks that in non-exit arbitral forums, they have a greater degree of control uh, in trying to, to, to challenge the enforceability of the award or try to set aside the award. One of the important requirements or one of the grounds on which you can challenge the enforceability is public policy, which is also reflected in the Indian Arbitration Conciliation Act. Uh, but this will not be true for exit arbitration. So I guess it's the fear of losing control when it comes to exit uh, arbitral awards, especially in, in situations of adverse arbitral award that perhaps uh, is, is, is one of the reasons why India uh, has decided not yes. to find exit convention. So, Prabhas, that very rightfully, actually, very rightfully, you have been able to frame the concerns. Uh, I'm sure uh, Maggie is making note of that. But now uh, you also mentioned about, yes, a concern which is uh, morally inclined uh, towards the developing countries, you say. And of course, uh, the concerns about the enforcement uh, and the control of the award is very relevant, I understand. So uh, what, before I move on, uh, I just want to tell our participants that uh, Prabhas has actually authored a book, which is titled India and the Investment Treaties. And uh, I suggest that you can have them for a reference. So now, Claudia, uh, we have witnessed uh, you know, a few Latin American countries like Ecuador, 
Bolivia and Venezuela. They have denounced the uh, exit convention in 2007, 9 and 12 respectively. What happened? Did they realize uh, that this uh, convention is putting them to a disadvantage? If yes, then how? And uh, what actually resulted in these countries, you know, exiting uh, the convention? And also tell us, uh, I was trying to understand that what are the repercussions of such an exit? I mean, you were a part of exit earlier and then you uh, moved out of it. So what happens there? I will, of course, uh, come back to you about asking about the alternatives, uh, the alternative forums for uh, going for these investment disputes. But for that what really uh, happened? What was uh, the problem, the concerns that uh, states in your jurisdiction were facing that made them uh, exit this convention? Uh, thank you, Mabendra. And, and, and I also want to thank the center and, and ICSID for the invitation. It's, it's wonderful to be here with all of you. Uh, what happened? You know, that's the, that's a very fundamental question. I think that the, you know Latin America was asking, uh, as you say, in two thousand and seven, uh, with the exit of uh, Bolivia, the denunciation of the exit convention by Bolivia, um, and then Ecuador, and then finally Venezuela. Uh, so I think at the time, you know, when those three Latin American countries were leaving the uh, exit. There was, of course, a lot of commotion, you know, and in, in not only in the region, but I think, uh, I think uh, around the world, uh, questioning whether, uh, you know, the fact that those three Latin American countries denounced the Exit Convention uh, was actually, you know, a, a point that other countries they needed to assess. Uh, you know, and, and and I think at that point in time, um, a lot of us uh, um, discussing on the uh, legitimacy of uh, the exit system, you know, whether the concerns that those three countries, Latin American countries brought to the table, you know, to, for discussions, uh, the, uh, the, uh, one of the points is, uh, uh, you know, transparency was one of the biggest points uh, that they were concerned about that. Uh, but also one of the biggest uh, criticisms that the three countries made is that they um, they were putting forward the uh, the argument that uh, it was uh, biased, you know, and there were some legitimacy uh, uh, concerns in connection with the system. Um, ultimately, I think with time, we came to realize that uh, one of the uh, um, important points for the three countries was more of a political reason, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and maybe a political economic, uh, economic decision that the three countries did. Um, uh, the, but when you dig a little bit more into uh, the reasons of the three countries, I personally think that, of course, there were some valid concerns that the countries had, uh, but others probably, you know, uh, were part of the whole confusion in the sense that uh, uh, um, uh, not the three countries wanted to totally refute, you know, or prohibit the practice of uh, international arbitration. And I think that's important to say because originally uh, I think people were concerned that that's, that was the direction that the whole Latin America was taking. And in fact, you know, we saw that later on, uh, some of the Latin American countries uh, actually, they even ratified the exit convention, uh, you know, even despite the fact that uh, those three uh, countries left uh, uh, exit. Um, I think for Latin America being one of uh, one of the blocks in the world that has ratified a lot of bilateral investment treaties and a lot of um, international investment agreements with um, uh, you know with investment chapters uh, which call for uh, exit arbitration, additional facility arbitration, or unicentral arbitration facilities uh, uh, cases. I'm sorry. Uh, you will realize that Latin America is doing a lot of uh, uh, a lot of investment arbitration cases. In fact, when you take the statistics and and thank you, Meg, for sending me the statistics for Latin America, and that was very useful. But when you really go into the statistics. Uh, you know, you realize that uh, um, Latin America continues to be a big block, uh, um, you know, doing mixed arbitration cases. In 2008, uh, by checking the statistics, I realized that uh, still 34% of uh, the cases that exit register, uh, they concern in one way or another a Latin American country. Uh, and probably this is connected to the fact that, uh, as I was saying, all these uh, countries, they have a lot of bilateral investment treaties. 
so um, I don't know if I have, uh, you know, the correct answer here. Uh, it is true that when you go back in time, you know, and and, and look at the, the 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 reasons and the causes that the three the the the, the three countries, you know, decided to. Uh, you know, to apply in order to leave exit, um, you realize that they were also pushing, actually, they were pushing to create their own parallel system, uh, you know, to have, uh, to have a system where they could resolve investment disputes, very similar, actually, to, to, to the exit system. Uh, but at the end of the day, that never really came into light. Uh, what we did see, uh, in fact, is that especially Ecuador and Bolivia, uh, they terminated, uh, if not all of the bilateral investment treaties that they concluded, most of the bilateral investment treaties. Uh, so, um, but they still rely a lot on the practice of international commercial arbitration. And I know that uh, at some point, uh, a lot of uh, the, um, commentary was saying that Ecuador was actually going to be completely out of the system. Venezuela was going to be completely out of the system. When you really look at what is going on, you realize that they are not uh, completely out of the system, you know, so and um, probably because, you know, they still have some of these international agreements that they are respecting, you know, and they are uh, uh, they are the, the handling cases still. Uh, the uh, the situation as we have it right now uh, with exit is uh, because I, of I, I see that uh, Claudia is finding a conflict of interest since you have been in exit before. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Meg, I, I'll give you, I, I would uh, want you to like, take a minute, now that you've heard both uh, Prabhas and Claudia. Claudia. Claudia has been a little more diplomatic though, but uh, can you like uh, in a one minute, uh, uh, I mean, tell us that their concerns are being addressed and what are you looking at? For, for well, that? absolutely. Also, also Meg, uh, also just briefly tell us like, if a country, uh, I mean, exists the convention, then what, what is the procedure for joining again and what happens? What are the side effects of that? All right. Uh, just in terms of Claudia's question, I think just the points I'd want to underline is while the three apparently left ICSID, and I'd suggest if you look at the record, that wasn't about ICSID services, but was more about a political issue. Since then, more than 14 have joined. So I don't see it as a, a denunciation of the system at large. We still have more than 20 cases with respect to Venezuela done under the additional facility. Um, so these uh, states are still a part of the system in a different way. In terms of joining, we've always said states are sovereign. They are welcome to join ICSID. They are welcome to leave ICSID. And they are welcome to rejoin uh, following just the regular process. So I hope at some point <laughs> we will see those three states. <laughs> Thank you. Because back I have, in the uh, family. <laughs> because Claudia raised the very concern of the legitimacy of ICSID itself. Okay, so uh, Jan has been really waiting patiently, you know, waiting when I'm going to come to him. Okay, so uh, great, Claudia, Mac, thank you so much. Uh, now that we have heard uh, the opportunities that Exit brings and uh, the concerns from uh, both the Latin American and the South Asian perspective, I want to understand also for the benefit of our participants, how this whole landscape of investment arbitration has evolved over a few decades. And who better than Yon who can tell us about it? Because Yon, you have been practicing this particular field for the last 40 years, I guess. And first 20 years, you have been representing states and then next 20, you have been adjudicating as an arbitrator. <laughs> so uh, do tell us also uh, for the benefit of all of us that how has this whole jurisdiction evolved? And uh, do you agree or not agree? I don't know if it is a belief, a disbelief or a misbelief or a myth, but yes, people do think that uh, ICSID favors the rich investors of the West by protecting them from the host state jurisdiction. What are your views on that, John? Well, uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm pleased to have been invited to be with you here today. Um, so take a few steps back and look at the beginning. When um, the ICSID convention was being elaborated and negotiated, uh, I was not yet a teenager. We were in the early 60s. Um, and um, it, um, discussions were had all over the world to talk about this new idea of ICSID. Uh, large conferences were held in Addis Ababa for Africa, Bangkok for Thailand, Santiago de Chile for Latin America, Washington, Geneva for uh, the Northern countries. 
Um, and every single uh, delegate who negotiated that treaty was representing a state, every single one of them, everyone with a duty to represent the interests of states, um, not to maximize profits of corporations, obviously. Uh, that's true of every single bilateral investment treaty. Uh, and that's true of, even more true, of every investment uh, statute negotiated by, uh, uh, enacted by a parliament. Why? were uh, these individuals at the beginning of the system so keen uh, to promote um, uh, international uh, investor state dispute resolution mechanisms because they were exceedingly thirsty for foreign investment. Uh, this was a time after colonialization, I'll get into that, but uh, there, there had been an early belief by some in uh, what, the, what in the French language was called the politique de la, rup la rupture, the politics of rupture. So we, we, every state should be autarkic and do everything for itself economically. Um, that led to disillusion and so something else was going to happen. So there was a great thirst for um, foreign investment. Uh, did this initiative of creating uh, ICSID in 1965 uh, create an, an immediate explosion? Of course not. Uh, so I divide this into, into three periods. Uh, the first period was the first 25 years when there were nine cases, um, and I was in high school, so I didn't know very much about this at all, uh, but it was, a, it, it was a marginal phenomenon uh, of interest to, to scholars who were wondering if anything would ever happen. Uh, then you had um, uh, two periods of, of, of particular interest to me, uh, because there's, there's a lot more to say, or there's a lot more happening. So the 20 years from 1980 to um, 200, uh, un until then, you had not even a case, one case per year. You, you had not even one case registered every two years. So 1980 to, to the year 2000, you had more happening, 62 cases in 20 years. That's like three cases a year. And I was, I was, became, for some reason, became very active in that period. Um, I was involved in 10 uh, investor state uh, arbitrations, not all exit cases eight on the side of states, two on the side of investors. Uh, and it, it was, a, it was a quite interesting to me, and I, I reflected at the time on, on wh why this had happened and what was the reaction to these early cases. I will tell you something um, that uh, may not be in, in, intuitively obvious. My interlocutors in the states tended to be two different ministries, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, and the Ministry of Commerce. And they had very, very different ideas about this. Um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs wanted to get, view this as a problem and an annoyance, something to get rid of the, the claim that was being uh, raised. And if it could be done on the basis of a jurisdictional objection, that would be good. Ministry of Commerce was conscious of the fact that um, uh, if the case was defeated without using the neutral mechanism, you'd still have a very unhappy investor. And they viewed this not so much as a problem to, to try to make go away. They viewed it as a general problem of investor relations and a very, very different attitude toward it. And if you think about it, um, if you win a case, for example, if, if you um, avoid the international dispute resolution mechanism, um, you, haven't, um, uh, you haven't defeated the claim, you've avoided it. In, um, in the perspective of the investor. Um, now, uh, my observation of the following 20 years, um, 2000 to 2020, uh, that's something like 735 cases, uh, more than a tenfold increase. Um, and it's um, evolved in a way which uh, is somewhat startling to me in this sense, uh, that um, this type of dispute, international dispute, dispute resolution, which before was extremely exceptional and extraordinary and treated as something very rare to be considered very carefully when you went into it and you were very aware of every step that you took because this was unusual, has become something which is relatively routine. Uh, and that is a source of concern to me. I think it's um, important to recapture the sui generis nature of investor state uh, uh, dispute resolution. The search for neutrality is obvious and the advantages of neutrality in terms of instilling investor uh, confidence uh, is, is, is very important. Uh, but uh, if 
uh, this type of arbitration is treated like any um, commercial arbitration or arbit say arbitration between two private parties, you're missing a lot of what is specific here. And in, this, in the case of two private parties, you don't have one party giving up to some extent sovereign prerogatives in terms of legislation, uh, as, uh, as was just mentioned, uh, and in terms of, of, of concerns for other things than making profits. Uh, and, and hence, uh, it, is, it is something that shouldn't be uh, lost track of. What is, um, to conclude, this is a very quick helicopter overview. Uh, I think the, the, the question is not, we, we, we've seen that coincidentally with this um, gro Im immense growth of investor state arbitration, not only in ICSID, but in other, uh, in other fora as well. And by now I've, I've acted for 10 different states, some of the frequent flyers with uh, in one case, 10 cases and another one, four cases. Um, the, the, the right question uh, isn't, uh, is, is really to, is, is not, does this create more investment or not? Uh, co there is a coincidence of a great increase in foreign capital investment if we look at the periods uh, since uh, 1965, certainly until today. But that's not the right question. I think, is the host countries getting the, re the right kind of investment? You will always get investors who are willing to come. Are you getting good investors who make long-term investments, who uh, uh, themselves abide by the rule of law and are anxious to uh, pay taxes and, and, and respect labor, uh, labor ordinances, or are they in there for the short time and yeah. therefore require quick rewards you know, as long as their friends are in power, making really ad hoc deals? I mean, um, yeah, I mean, uh, you're very rightfully, I mean, the, taken us towards the journey and exactly. I, but I, I would like to believe that when you say routine, I, I would uh, see that it means acceptability. It is, is it that uh, states have uh, moved on to the more acceptability for exit now? Probably I would have uh, liked to go to uh, Meg for some comments on that, but since we're running a little late in time, I would now want to move on to Prabhas. Prabhas, I would like to uh, draw your attention to the uh, model BIT. You see uh, India got its first adverse award in 2011, of course, from the white industries. What had happened was that uh, the MFN clause in the India-Australia BIT was invoked. Uh, to use the provision of uh, effective means of asserting claims and enforcing rights, which formed part of the india Kuwait BIT. That actually came as a jolt and India unilaterally withdrew all its BITs and worked on each BIT negotiated. They are in the process of negotiating every BIT now on a case-to-case -case basis. And of course, 3D shopping is something which is very prevalent now. We all uh, would acknowledge that. What is interesting is uh, the absence of the FET and the MFN clauses in the model BIT. And of course, uh, somehow India does not really like the idea of uh, you know, uh, investors borrowing those beneficial substantive as well as uh, procedural provisions from the third country BITs. Do you think this is, an, uh, this is the mindset, uh, the right mindset for an investment seeking country? Is there a possibility for India to be modifying its ISDS approach? And uh, has it, uh, uh, I mean, perfected the model BIT over an extent that uh, that's going to find relevance in all its uh, BITs in the future. So what do you think? Yeah, Madhvendra, I think uh, India's model BIT is actually a reaction to all the claims that have come up against India. So if you look at several clauses, these are direct reactions, or if I can use the word knee-jerk reactions to the claims that have come up against India. Now, on MFN specifically, I can understand the concern of treaty shopping or of foreign investors trying to borrow beneficial provisions from third country BITs. Uh, but the solution to that is not not to have the MFN provision at all. To do away with the MFN provision is is not the right uh, is is not the right way to uh, uh, let investors not borrow beneficial provisions. Uh, what I have argued in my book and in my writings is that what India instead should have done was to have a qualified MFN, which restricts the foreign investors from borrowing beneficial provisions from third country BITs, if that at all is India's concern. But at the same time, you retain non-discrimination as the cornerstone of investment treaty relations, because that, that is one of the founding principles on which investment treaty law or international economic law for that matter has been built. 
uh, on on ISDS again, my concern is not with the ISDS system as such. I mean, I, I agree that there are concerns in terms of transparency, etc. Uh, uh, things have definitely become better than what they were maybe 20 years back. Uh, things are more transparent today. Many awards become public. Uh, so uh, what India instead needs to focus on, and I think this is something about which in India we get a little touchy, uh, is that why why did these investors brought these claims against us and if we and as i have argued in my book if you carefully go through all these claims most of these claims came up because of what i think was bad regulation if india was little more circumspect uh, in enacting its regulatory measures whether pertaining to taxation or or cancellation of spectrum licenses or telecom licenses etc many of these many of these cases might not have come up in the first place so I think this, this while, while, while we should criticize and critique the ISDS mechanism and try to make it fairer, uh, at the same time, it's also important for India as, as, as a growing economy to introspect uh, and see whether it has been able to internalize its investment treaties at all levels, central government and state governments. And secondly, whether it is, it is exercising its regulatory part in a manner which is consistent with India's international law obligations. Uh, and, and this introspection is very, very critical in any understanding of India's concerns with the ISDS mechanism. Okay. Thank you, Prabhas. Thank you very much. In fact, uh, <clears throat> I have made a note of it. And probably whenever this comes up for discussions, we will certainly keep that in mind. Okay, so uh, that makes me go back to Claudia again. Uh, Meg, I'm going to come to you next. Uh, so you may have heard uh, Prabhas talking about uh, what India is thinking now and what are the concerns as, with regards to the model BIT also. So uh, would you uh, tell our audience about the alternatives that are available to exit and uh, also uh, the additional facilities that exit provides? Are they giving enough space to raise claims uh, with the non-signatory states? Is uh, ad hoc arbitration also a preferred uh, forum for dispute resolution? Also, uh, do states provide a mechanism, a good robust uh, uh, agreement? And are they willing to resolve disputes? And is it attracting the investors to come and invest in your countries just based on the commitment that the country is making through those agreements? So tell us about uh, what are the uh, various uh, choices of forums available for you in the absence of exit? Yeah, th thank you. I, I hope that now you can hear me better. I, I noticed that in the chat that someone said that uh, uh, I was too soft when I was talking, so I'm going to, to scream a little bit here. Um, uh, so uh, thank you for the questions. I mean, it's, it's actually something that is part of uh, the whole process, you know, the changes that we're seeing uh, in the system, you know, so uh, in the sense that uh, the VITs, they do provide you with different uh, fora, if you want, you know, the, to bring uh, cases, uh, uh, ISDS cases under those treaties. Uh, so uh, without saying that people are not doing exit anymore, because I, I don't think that's the case, uh, the countries I also, uh, I think, not necessarily the countries, because remember, uh, the first party who will be uh, the initiating the cases, the claimants, you know, so the, the claimants normally, uh, they are going to make strategic decisions at the beginning of the case in order to bring their case. So sometimes uh, the claimants, they opt not to go to exit, but not because of a criticism to exit or the legitimacy to exit, but it's more because strategically maybe it makes more sense for them uh, to walk away, for example, from the double barrel kill, uh, you know, Know, a test, uh, as uh, Meg was mentioning, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to the definition of investment or the requirements under Article 25 of the ICSID Convention. So they might decide, okay, let's not do ICSID, you know, let's go and, and try to do the arbitration case under the UNCTAD arbitration rules, which is a, a one of the possibilities that we see uh, in investment arbitration, uh, in, investment, in investment treaties. Uh, so, um, uh, that's one of the biggest points for consideration, in my opinion. You know, what is the strategic that the claimant is following in order to bring that case? Uh, and, uh, then, of course, the state is going to defend uh, before the, the fora where the, the, the claimant is bringing the case. 
And so to, for the second question, I mean, I know, we know, I, I know that we're running out of time, but I wanted to address a little bit the second part of your question in the sense that uh, is it really bringing, you know, the fact that you have the ratification of exit uh, or the fact that the states are uh, willing to do investment arbitration is really a, a, an element, you know, that will characterize these states to, uh, you know, to be very friendly uh, for the, to receive foreign investment. Um, I, I think uh, uh, I, I agree with Jan that it's it's not necessarily, you know, that there is a, a link connection. I think at the beginning of the whole process, you know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, that was one of the main elements. You know, people were saying, uh, yes, you need to ratify the exit convention or you need to have this bilateral message except to go to ISDS uh, in that way, you know, the country will receive more foreign investment. But nowadays, I don't necessarily see the, the link with yes. that. You know, I think there are other factors that we need to take into consideration. Very well, very well, Claudia. Thank you so much. Thank you. In fact, uh, you know, Mag, so much as I would wish that uh, while you are in the seat, you know, the number of uh, signatories go to 190 plus. But let me uh, talk about uh, Article 53.1 of the convention. It reads, the award shall be binding on the parties and shall not be subject to any appeal or to any other remedy except those provided for in this convention. I wanted to bring this right in the beginning, but you know, I just wanted to look at the perspectives and then bring in the, this particular clause. You know, probably this would qualify to uh, fall within the frame of manifest arbitrariness or the absence of jurisdiction of a host state, even in the matters of public policy. Uh, in the matter of Ecuador, we know that uh, the House of Lords held that awards arising out of uh, BIT disputes can be challenged in the courts of uh, the seat of arbitration. So uh, being in the ICSID, ICSID has really administered uh, numerous cases. So could you tell us uh, what is the current status of all these awards out of ICSID uh, with respect to the enforcement and challenge? And uh, also tell us what is the prevailing culture when it comes to the enforcement of these awards by the states, especially the ones having the adverse awards. Yep, absolutely. Uh, let me just talk a little bit about Article 53 because it is the gold standard and the very unique feature of ICSID. No other set of rules has that. So it makes ICSID awards final and binding in every one of the 155 member states. And that means that the peculiarity- you have, you have two minutes, you come to the point straight away. Very good. Uh, pecuniary obligations are directly enforceable, subject only to post-award remedies. So you can review under what's known as annulment, and the annulment grounds are essentially the same as the grounds under the New York Convention, but for public policy. And then it's directly, being able to do this is a much more efficient, less expensive way to enforce an award. It means you don't have to go to the courts of all the recognition jurisdictions or the foreign court of another domestic country, which is the place of arbitration. I think this is especially important for two reasons in India right now. Number one is there is a debate, as I understand it, with respect to the commercial reservation under the New York Convention and whether, in fact, an ISDS case would be considered uh, potentially enforceable. And that creates a real uncertainty, which you would not have under the ICSID scheme. Very well. The next part I wanted to note was something that Prabash uh, spoke about before, the idea of having greater control because there is a public policy exception, which yes, the ICSID rules do not have. But my question is, does that really provide you with greater control? Uh, traditionally, that, uh, that public policy exception is at a very high standard, basically fundamental principles of justice and morality. I don't know that it gives that much protection. I've tried to find ISDS cases overturned on that basis. I have not found any. And I think the model bit actually does what is much more effective, which is deal with public policy concerns up front, a right to regulate, follow the law and be in compliance, that's the effective way to deal with it. Wait, um, thank you for so that. I in fact, uh, I don't really want this. To, I really don't want this to turn into a debate between you and uh, Prabhash. But yes, Prabhash, I read your book and you have mentioned about the lack of transparency 
I, I want you 30 seconds. Just tell us what's your concern about 531. 30 seconds. No, I, I I agree with Meg at one level. I think it's it's it, it it doesn't really give greater control, but maybe it gives a perception of greater control uh, because you have more forums available where you can challenge it. Uh, you know, uh, but yeah, the 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 in my view, the advantages actually outweigh the disadvantages. And so we got the point, Prabhas. Thank you very much for that. I have a very important question for you on once again. See, uh, we all, we, I really want to benefit from your so much of experience. I want to know from you, Yohan, having uh, sitting as an arbitrator for so long, what has been the line of defense the respondents have been putting to you? And what do you think uh, the legislation of most of these states will lose in the end? Have they been a very conducive uh, environment or what is the subtle difference between these legislative uh, policies of two states where one loses and one just goes on fine? Well, uh, an, an attribute of sovereignty it was said by the International Court, by the World Court in, 19, in the early 1920s, uh, Permanent Court of International Justice at the time. An attribute of sovereignty is the, is the ability to make uh, binding promises. And it is impossible, it's been held a number of times in cases where European countries were the respondents that they cannot invoke uh, an internal law against it. Uh, but what, you know, the, Representing a state and an investor state dispute. Uh, let me just say why I have a bias in favor of the two specialized institutions. There are two of them, ICSID and the Permanent Court of Arbitration, because they are sensitive in the way they name arbitrators and in the culture that is, because this is all they do. So if you go to a general purpose arbitration institution or an ad hoc arbitration where you have none of that background, you, you, um, you don't get that benefit. And when you look at what ICSID does specifically in response to particular problems that come up with states, for example, adventurous claims that are manifestly outside the jurisdiction of ICSID, they can be dismissed at the level of the secretariat before the state has invested large amounts of money. There can be summary dismissal of, on the merits that should be available anywhere, but it's explicit and that was recent. That's the institution reacting specifically to the problems encountering. And one bugbear for me as a representative of the states, I really dislike the temerity of some arbitrators when faced with a request for security for costs, because there are some adventurous claims. And I think it should be clearer and arbitrators should be more courageous in terms of robustly doing that. Uh, and, and that is something you get as a result of the specificity of these two bodies. I, I, I assume that there are a number of Indians listening to us uh, here, and I'll ask one question to all of you. Uh, if you um, think that it is fine for India to be a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, as it has been for 121 years, uh, why not ICSID? And if there's something wrong with ICSID, why do you stay with the Permanent Court of Arbitration? And I would point out that there are in the ICSID treaty uh, two um, uh, articles, one dealing with jurisdiction and one dealing with enforcement specifically. With respect to jurisdiction, all signatory states accept the res judicata of ICSID arbitration awards, but they don't commit to enforcement in their own country. So I expect, I don't expect that um, a defense against enforcement based on public policy will simply be dismissed. Uh, by the courts of uh, the state that has lost an exit arbitration. Those are two very different things. And I don't think uh, in that sense um, that the state uh, is disrobed uh, and disentitled to invoke its own domestic public policy. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Yon. Thank you so much. Uh, in fact, uh, much of what you have spoken about, I think there is a lot of debate and the discussion which is happening even with the uh, Anshachal walking group. Also, I just, we were running a little late of time I just want to go to Meg now and just ask her about see, this uh, uh, subject of, uh, uh, of debate, uh, which is uh, the finality of an award vis-a-vis -vis the correctness of an award, which brings me to the uh, subject of appellate scrutiny at the level of exit, because that's been also being discussed in the working group. So does uh, having a provision of uh, appellate scrutiny uh, make it attractive for the states to by way of basically mitigating all the concerns of ISDS? Uh, uh, does it serve as a panacea for all the problems of ISDS and also uh, address the concerns about impartiality and lack of coherence and uh, lack of sometimes even the independence and impartiality of the appointed arbitrators? And of course, uh, the costs. 
So what are your views, Ken, Mick? That is the debate right there. Uh, in 2004, ICSID proposed to create an appellate mechanism and states said no. The issue has now come back on the front burner in particular because the European Union has proposed a full two level court, first trial level and second appellate level. It's being discussed at working group three. It's unclear what the result will be. There are those states who say things work fine as they are. We simply need to upgrade, update some of the rules in the fashion that ICSID is doing right now. And they feel the main problem is the substantive obligations and definition of those, and that new architecture isn't going to address what people identify as the problems, not to mention the cost of setting up a sui generis international court. Others feel that it is important to set up such a court in particular for the legitimacy and perceptions of legitimacy. And I think you could identify a third group that says, the system works well, we are improving at all times, but perhaps we could have an appellate body on top of the current level of tribunals, so sort of a hybrid. Nobody knows how this discussion will turn out, and I think there's a lot of discussing to do between now and any final conclusions. This has been around since well before 2004, and uh, we shall see where it goes. Yes, in fact, I see that uh, this particular uh, provision is figuring in the, the international investment agreements of a few countries, to say the least. Also, okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. It's been really a pleasure discussing about the substantive uh, topics that we've had. Now, uh, maybe we can like sum up. I just have one uh, last question for all of you. This is uh, a very important question. Shreya, just give us two minutes each. We're just going to wrap up. In fact, this question would serve to uh, wrap up all the issues together. And I would like to seek uh, comments from everyone, starting with Yon. Basically, this is about uh, you know, the subject of uh, the fine balance between the investor rights and the state obligations. We know that uh, uh, the clauses of FET and MFN are missing from the India BIT. Ghana has uh, explicitly and clearly defined what are the investor obligations in their agreements. And South Africa has liquidated ISDS. They have their own mechanism. And in fact, Australia is making provisions to negotiate uh, on a case-to-case -case basis. So how do you draw this balance? What are your final views uh, on this particular subject that uh, what are the uh, rights of investor and obligations of the host state? Uh, we'll start with Jan, followed by uh, Meg, Claudia, and then Pravas, you can give concluding thoughts. I can be short, I think, in this way. The lines to be drawn to affect this balance will always be moving and will never be settled. Uh, that, that is perfect. In fact, uh, Jan, before I forget, I just want to make a remark to that uh, statement you made that there's always a conflict of uh, understanding between the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Commerce. <laughs> so that's uh, always going to remain as it comes to like, you know, ratifying conventions like this. Okay, Meg, uh, the final remarks on the balance that you have invested the rights and the post uh, state obligations. Yeah, it's quite correct that the balance comes first and foremost in the individual countries bit, and it will be in different places for different countries. And we are seeing these changes. We are seeing things like denial of benefits clauses, et cetera. But I wanted to just add one point, which is very important. Apart from the bit, look at the arbitral rules and certainly I am very convinced our arbitral rules are balanced. And one of the biggest myths in investment is that investors always win or states always win. And our exit statistics shows you year after year after year, about 35% of the cases settle, 31% are in favor of the investor and 34 in favor of the states. So the empirical indicia we have is that this is very much balanced results. Perfect, Claudia. Uh, thank you. I uh, I think it's uh, actually what we also need to. I agree with Jana with Meg what they are saying, but I think we also need to look at uh, uh, the work of the arbitral tribunals. You know that uh, through those decisions, in the sense that they of course have great responsibility on really achieving this uh, this balance. You know, so and I think uh, the more mature, the more evolution that we see on the system, uh, we also. I mean, it also has an immediate effect. 
you know, so we saw it with NAFTA, for example, at the beginning, how NAFTA developed and then how the contracting states of NAFTA, they needed to intervene, you know, to, uh, to issue no, uh, interpretative notes, you know, for those arbitral tribunals in order to give them the framework, you know, what we were thinking when they were negotiating those contracts. I think, of course, as Jan said it at the at the very beginning, I mean, the fact that we have ISDS is because the states, you know, they're willing to uh, weigh their sovereign powers, you know, in order to go to this type of uh, of uh, sediment dispute mechanisms. So let's not forget that, and that, of course, is going to really have an important element on whatever. Uh, this whole world of ISDS is moving because the states, they, they are a big component of this, and, uh, if not the most important component of the system. Thanks. Yes, Prabhas. Yeah, no, my quick comment is about India because that's what I've studied for the last several years. I think uh, in India, the balance or the pendulum uh, initially was uh, too much in favor of investors. Uh, and in the last four to five years, it has swung to the other end, to the other extreme and too much in favor of the state. I think it needs to be brought somewhere in the middle, maybe. Okay. How you do that, we, we require a separate seminar for that. Oh, wow, that's perfect. Perfect summing up by Prabhas. Thank you so much, Prabhas. In fact, uh, I would say that that was really a very uh, meaningful summing up of all the issues with respect to bringing out uh, all the aspects about the balance. Now, uh, uh, in the end, I only like to say you know, to Meg that I, I hope that we are able to weed out all the concerns and convert the... Uh, challenges, I mean, all the uh, or the uh, alternatives into the opportunities and that you have 190 plus members to your uh, uh, convention. Uh, uh, Shreya, I understand MCI has given us an extension of five minutes, but we need to take a few Q&A. Let me just see if we can take one or two at least. The first question I have got myself on my WhatsApp from a dear friend of mine is that he wants to understand uh, from Meg that what is the mechanism that you follow for the appointment of arbitrators in the tribunal for these uh, investor state disputes. Do you also, uh, think, uh, what goes, like there's a debate going on in India is that appointment of uh, retired judges and uh, technical arbitrators. You tell us uh, what is the provision for uh, the mechanism that you follow? First and foremost, we follow whatever is in the treaty. Most treaties allow each party to select a party appointed arbitrator and those parties usually agree on a presiding. Where they can't, they can ask the center to intervene and to assist them with this process. And where that is requested, we offer usually uh, a ballot, which is here's a list of five people. Would any of them be mutually acceptable? Or a list where parties rank from one to five and the best ranked would be the presiding. If parties don't choose that, ICSID will select someone from the pool of arbitrators that is uh, the names given by member states. I said earlier, if India joined, it could put eight people into this pool. We are able to pull someone from that pool. And uh, that pool consists of the world's most experienced arbitrators, different nationalities, et cetera. I should also say we've been trying very hard and I think have had some success in increasing diversity of the arbitral group, in particular, uh, regional diversity and gender diversity. That's a concern, I think, of all institutions right now. But that's the basic process. And throughout, we consult the parties on the attributes of the arbitrators that they want. So that's a quick how appointment is done. Perfect, Meg. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, I would, uh, I mean, I would urge the panelists also to just go through the Q&A and see if there is any question that is of interest to you. Uh, there's a question for uh, Jan Paulson. Uh, uh, how do we make ISDS an exceptional dispute resolution route? Would you advocate greater jurisdictional requirements to deter investors from approaching tribunals? Jan. Would you require what? I didn't understand that. Uh, uh, would you advocate uh, greater judicial requirements to deter investors from approaching tribunals? Well, this is, um, uh, as Meg just said, that ICSID re respects uh, what is set forth in particular treaties. So this is certainly a possibility. But then um, if a state takes back with one hand what it gives with the other, uh, I'm not sure you have, you have achieved very much. Uh, and if the approach to investor relations uh, is always um, a compromise, 
which becomes unpredictable, I don't think it gives uh, investors very much to feel um, confident when they make their risk analysis in, choice, in choosing, as many important investors do, in choosing between one um, target host country and another uh, to weigh in the balance of, of that choice. Okay, thank you, uh, Yon. Uh, Prabhas, there's a question for you. Uh, it says, uh, does uh, termination of BITs will have or uh, have an impact on the investments in India? What do you think? Quickly, 30 seconds, if you can tell us. Does it really affect uh, the investments? Or like initially, we had started off saying that the impeccable FDI record that India has had, despite uh, you know, rescinding all its BITs and going on case to case basis. What do you think? In brief, tell us the participants. How, does, how much uh, effect does it has? Yeah, well, I'm not an economist, but uh, the empirical studies that have been done in India, uh, they suggest that there is indeed a, a, a co-relationship uh, between uh, investment treaties and FDI. There's a recent study which the Indian Council of Research on, Indian, on International Economic Relations has published. Uh, and their findings are that cumulatively speaking, BITS and ISDS have had a positive impact on FDI inflows in India. There's another study which has recently argued that termination of investment treaties uh, will have a negative impact on FDI inflows in India. So there is limited empirical evidence which shows a positive relationship between the two. Okay, uh, Claudia, would you like to take that uh, question with respect to your jurisdiction? Um, which question? The one that uh, does, uh, uh -huh. does does uh, does terminating these BITs and uh, not being a part of an international convention like said does really affect investments in your country or does it have no effect at all? Yeah, listen, I, I think you have a different kind of studies, you know, that they are out there. Some, of course, in favor, as uh, uh, Prabash was mentioning, you know, or indicating that there is a relation, but there always comes into the debate uh, the, 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 the example of Brazil, you know, I mean, Brazil has ratified a few bilateral investment treaties. Uh, most of the ones that Brazil has ratified, they don't have a provision for ISDS. Uh, so when it's still, you know, Brazil is, is one of the most uh, uh, important countries in the world receiving uh, foreign, uh, foreign direct investment. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think uh, the debate continues. I don't think that I have the answer. I'm not an economist either. But what I think, uh, you know, when you talk to clients, uh, uh, yeah, the fact that the state has a BIT, um, you know, it, it, it is an element, I, I will say. That's true, Claudia. That's true. Also, uh, something which is, uh, uh, I mean, not very insignificant, I would say, is that also the mindset of the investors who are investing in a particular country. Do they have a really uh, kind of a business mindset or they're like litigative kind of a mindset? Certain people come for investments only looking at disputes arising out of it and, you know, benefiting out of those things. But uh, anyways, I think with that, uh, we have come to the end of our session. And uh, as a concluding remark, I would just like to uh, emphasize on the uh, importance of, uh, you know, keeping in mind as arbitrators and the practitioners of arbitration is the importance of party autonomy should always be kept supreme. And uh, the freedom and uh, the flexibility that this ADR provides to all the parties involved are the cornerstones of ADR. It's not really always important to do good things, but as is also important to prevent bad from happening. So I think all of us should put our foot together, pull together and ensure that the arbitration moves in the right direction. And in the end, uh, only thing left for me to do is once again, thank MCIA and thank Neeti and uh, Madhukeshwar Shreya for the introduction and uh, all the panelists, like distinguished panelists, I've had an opportunity to speak with you all. Wonderful, thank you so much. Shreya, I'll uh, hand it over to you for the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Madhavindra. And a big thank you to all the panelists for a very enriching discussion. Um, with this, we come to a close of day two of the India ADR week. Um, there will be sessions again from tomorrow, 10 a.m. onwards, and I really hope to see all of you there as well. Thank you. Good night.